week. What should you do when someone is against you? Now, when someone doesn't like you, I mean that they are vehemently opposed. Pray down thunder to strike them. Okay, there's an idea. Hmm. Okay, good. See. Just, just kinda mess up their mind. Just like uh, yeah, Okay. Mind tricks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, they wouldn't expect that. I mean okay. if you go if somebody is against you or you know maybe you, they they probably wouldn't. Okay. Any other ideas? They ignore them. <laughs> Are you being serious or is this a joke? I couldn't tell because you laughed. Seriously joking. You know, like, if, if, <laughs> if, you, if you try to work with them and all they do is they're against you, against you, against you, against you, against you, no matter what you do or no matter what you say, well, maybe it's time to break away from them. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. What do you think? Any other ideas? You should pray for them. Okay. Oh, yes. I'm surprised that that was the last thing that was mentioned, but okay. <laughs> Maybe find out what their favorite candy is and bring it to them every day. Okay. We could also, you know, send them fingers in the mail. <laughs> We could use an example, real life example. Get crazy, get cray cray in here. Hypothetically, let's say a church wanted to start a men's center. Hypothetically, and pretty much everybody in the, in the town just like peed all over themselves out of like just complete rejection. Oh, that's weird. And so they yeah. do everything in their power to uh, to make this a no go. What do you do, Pastor? You can control the town for them and let them all yell at you. <laughs> oh, and make them think that it doesn't sound like that would work. Give them three donuts too. All right. Do you think that they would want to maybe pray about what you're doing? Okay. So it's the right thing you're supposed to be doing. Hopefully, you did that before you got going on it. Right, oh, but yeah. if people are if people are against you. Maybe, but, maybe you heard wrong. But <laughs> I don't know. the Bible often states that when people are opposed to you, you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Opposition goes towards people who are doing the wrong thing and towards those people who are doing the right thing. So. I'm not sure that works. Hypothetically, you're a pastor, and you go to church, to church, to church, because every single church you go to, they throw you out of it. What about that kind of thing? <clears throat> Maybe you're doing something wrong, and it's not the church, it's you. Not necessarily. Sometimes there are church, there are churches called turnaround churches. Basically what it means is that the church has been neglected for so long that you have a bunch of really immature Christians, and oftentimes they think that they're really mature because they've been saved for a long time. So then what happens is they literally oppose anything that is a change of anything. In other words, they chew up pastors and spit them out. This is very, very common in places that are more churchified than other places. Like, for instance, Texas probably has a lot more of them than Montana, for instance. You see I'm getting that here? Um, so, technically, it could potentially be a hard-hearted church. A turnaround church. Potentially. Or it could just be that you're a terrible pastor. <laughs> Although we did learn in a meeting that they can't just kick you out if you voted in. There's due process unless you did something immoral or something that they can't kick you out. <laughs> I may, you may try and kick me out, but I'll die here. <laughs> Just to get you. <laughs> I got nothing else to do with my life. Honestly, nothing. <laughs> awesome. Well, 
one thing I kind of want to um, mention, we're looking at Proverbs, you know, it's talking about how to live wisely. And I think it's worth mentioning, along with prayer, gold stuff for Jack, along with prayer, were you going to say something? Ask them why they're against you. Yeah, I guess too, yeah. Um, but along with prayer, um, what I would suggest is doing, say, say the course and still do the right thing, which is the wise thing. Doing the right thing doesn't have to be, well, they just have to deal with it, and I'm just doing the right thing, and I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Once again, doing the right thing wisely. Stay the course with wisdom. So don't just ignore them. It really depends the situation, honestly. Sometimes it's a good idea to ignore people. Sometimes. Because there's nothing else you can't do. But, a lot of times, it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? A lot of times, you just kind of have to endure it. You know what I mean? Give it time, too, for people to think. Yeah. Uh-huh. The Bible talks about winning people over. The righteous person wins people over with the, with their patience and their, with their wisdom. That's the kind of the idea you want to you want to handle every situation not as just writing them off. Oh well, they're never going to change. They're always going to oppose me no matter what I do. You don't want to get in that mindset. You know, get rid of that. What you want to get into is this idea. I need to handle every situation, including this one that I'm currently in, as though I'm going to win them. And like Zach said, don't rush it. Okay. Onward we go into Proverbs 13 and 14 tonight. Any questions before we get going? No. Let me finish this last bite. Because <laughs> it's just a little piece. I mean, what am I going to do with this? Is that 7-Up? Yeah, it's cherry lining. Can you see her trying to roll up the couch? I, I don't care about this. So much as this. Oh. <laughs> don't judge me. I'm Michael, and I have this huge gallon it's jug of homemade cherry <laughs> limey, but I'd rather yeah, turn that plate all seven up. Mmm. <laughs> 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 Alright, let's see what we Now, what I would suggest, pretty much from here on out, we're going to be finishing tonight, and we'll be in chapter 15 for not next week, because we'll be at, having the barbecue, but two weeks from now. We'll be picking up back up in 15. So what I would suggest you doing is read through 15 all the way in through 30. Not through 31, just through 30. Highly recommend that. And then I would recommend uh, making special note of anything that doesn't make sense, that sticks out to you, anything like that. And then as we get up to it, excuse me, ask questions or whatever, because you never know. Your question might be something somebody else has a question of. So, Proverbs 13, starting verse 1. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Um, we've talked about this. This is a, a kind of a theme throughout Proverbs, so I'm not really going to look at it, but one thing I did want to want to point out is the idea of the father being the close relationship, as and but a scoffer does not listen to any rebuke. You know? uh, verse 2. From the fruit of his mouth, a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. So basically, what we have here notice notice the the um, the place of the heart and the mouth here. From the fruit of his mouth, a man eats what is good. Okay, so talking about how wisdom comes back and comes back to us, right? But then the desire of the treacherous, which is from the heart, always comes out through the mouth. Remember, that's a that's kind of a theme throughout Proverbs. That something has an origin in the heart, comes out through the mouth, and it affects things or it changes how we act. But the desire of the treacherous is for violence. So anything they say is going to be um, some, 
congruent. Uh, uh, um, what's the word? It's going to be connected. Anything they say is going to be connected with that with that desire for violence from their heart. Okay. Verse uh, three. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The idea of shutting up is oftentimes the better idea. <laughs> Verse 4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Notice notice that. He's not saying the, the, the wicked and the righteous. You see what he said there? The soul of the sluggard. Someone who puts off till tomorrow what they could have done today. Somebody who doesn't work. Somebody who just kind of sits around all day on their butts. You know, a lazy person. a um, Someone who, sh who not just shugs off work, sh shrugs, shrugs off work, but goes to the pursuit to the end of, of trying to avoid it. You know what I mean? Is this past procrastinating? Huh? Is this past procrastinating? Procrastinating? Uh, well, no, they kind of go hand in hand throughout Proverbs. Um, yeah, they, 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 they're real closely connected. So, uh, the idea here is that a sluggard and procrastination would be maybe the first step towards being a sluggard. Oh, okay. If you wanted to make a distinction, I guess. Uh, but so far, I don't think he's any, said anything about procrastination. Oh no, yeah, a, a couple a couple chapters ago, he said the, the, a little a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. I think that was in chapter ten, right? Ten or eleven, I think. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, so he did talk about procrastination. But anyways, uh, and then he says, uh, Sluggard craves and gets nothing because he didn't <laughs> he didn't do it. While the soul of the diligent, somebody who who, who per perseveres in work, endures hard work, you know that kind of idea, um, is richly supplied because they went out and, and worked. I mean, it's not. You see a lot of people in Tularosa who are oblivious to this principle. You mean I have to work, and then I get paid for working, and then I use that money to buy my food? Yeah, it's a crazy idea. I know. And then verse 5, the righteous hates falsehood, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. Because the wicked don't hate falsehood, they are led astray and experience shame and disgrace as a result. See, it says the righteous hates falsehood, and then it just ends there. But then it says, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. Well, he said about the righteous, their outlook on something, they just hate falsehood. Well, because they hate falsehood, they're not going to do the things that bring the shame and disgrace. See, the shame and disgrace is the result of not hating falsehood. See? Verse 6, Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. Verse 7, One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Now this one, this one's, excuse me, this one's kind of interesting. First off, things aren't always as they seem. That's the first thing to note from this verse. But, it, gets, it goes a little bit beyond that. There's, there's another kind of idea here. There is a possible reference to a spiritual wealth. In other words, so, someone may pretend to be spiritually rich, although spiritually they're not rich. And then also there's another kind of idea here. Oh, and then the second part would be, you know, another pretends to be spiritually poor, you know, poor of spirit, humble, in other words, yet has great wealth, and his wealth would be his wisdom. See what I mean? Um, that's it, it's kind of possible for either reason. He, uh, either reading, he could be talking about literal wealth, wealth and rich, riches and whatnot, or he could be talking about metaphorical. Really hard to hard to tell. But there's also another possibility. Of these t saying one pretends to be rich physically, yet has nothing spiritually. Think of like a CEO who's yeah. spiritually corrupt yet is very successful in business world. Um, another pretends to be poor physically. Christians live in a, in a way that is is not anti-materialistic, but not in the pursuit of materialism. Um, yet has great wealth. So if you see, there's kind of some there's kind of a principle here that he's like talking simplistic. about. Simplistic. Yeah, simplistic. There's the word. Simplistic. Yes. Um, so there's kind of a principle here that kind of goes beyond into other into other areas, but it seems best to assume that what he's actually talking about is literal riches, as in money. And literal poorness is in lack of lack of money. It's always best to err on the side of caution. Um, usually, you don't want to add metaphorical or secret hidden meanings to passages. 
Um, I just wanted to bring it to your attention as a possibility because there is definitely the principle there that applies. However, I think originally he was talking about actual riches. Some people pretend to be real great people, you know, look at me, and then they actually, they're just holding up their, their appearance with credit cards and stuff. They're not actually, you know, so... But the idea here is that things aren't always how they seem. Verse 8, the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man here is no threat. Basically, how often do you hear a poor person get kidnapped for a ransom? Well, you don't. How often do you hear a rich person? Well, okay, now, now we've got NCIS, CSI, you know, white collar. I mean, let's go down the list. <laughs> um and the idea here is just kind of a, a casual observation here that, that the wealth of the rich people is technically their security, but it's also their harm. Yeah. So you have it kind of as, as a double-sided coin. Um, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Verse 10, by insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Insolence is kind of like, um, uh, let's just say pride. Uh, let's keep things simple. It, the different, You could get a little bit carried away there. So look it up in a dictionary if you want the more precise meaning, but we'll just substitute it for pride for tonight, okay? By pride comes nothing but strife. In other words, when you think you've got all the answers, it's going to cause you to get in a lot of fights with people. In fact, uh, this is an ESV study Bible, which I'd highly recommend you, doing, you guys getting. It, um, it actually is where I got the idea of breaking down the first nine chapters into 13 messages. I got that from here. So uh, it, had a, it had a note about it that I wanted to, wanted to um, read part of. It says, one of the main reasons people quarrel or argue and fight is because they are stubborn about their own ideas and opinions and are unwilling to admit that they may be wrong. So that's basically, you know, a real good summary, uh, sum, summarization of, of what's going on here. But with those who take advice is wisdom. Just slow down for a minute, Rambo. You know, listen for a second. Right. Verse 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. Now this is, pay attention to this one. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Yeah. Wait, what? What? How many people win the lottery and... And actually do something with it. <laughs> so here's here's the thing, guys. You learn money's value when you go into work every single day. When you inherit money after never working a day in your life, you blow through that money. If somebody just gives you $100, you blow through it. I got some stuff on Amazon I wanted, and you know what I mean? Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And there's also the idea here that if you, um, you know, get money very rapidly by immoral means, obviously it's not going to last either. There's that kind of hint there because he's already mentioned it, so it seems to be maybe possibly referencing it. Um, which I want to kind of give give another word of warning with this. It might not be the best thing to give your kids money. It might be a better thing to teach them the value of money. Yeah. And then, not just how to earn it, how to slow it leaving your bank. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. Slowing down the... the in, in, speeding up the, the in, intake of money, slowing down the out, outpour. So, really a great verse there. Uh, how many times do you see parents try to yeah. Do something good and it just doesn't work. Anyways, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Now, over the over the next couple of verses, he's going to come back to this theme a couple times. The idea of uh, of um, getting something that, you, that you've been longing for, breaking joy. Okay, now, hold on. He's going he's gonna to reference this in just a few verses, so I don't want to get a hold of my, oh, ahead of myself here. But So, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Uh, think about when um, uh, somebody who's been wanting kids for a long time and they just can't seem to get pregnant. Hope deferred. But then what happens when they finally do get pregnant? After years and years of trying. But a desire fulfilled is the tree of life. It just, the joy is within them, you know what I mean? Verse 13, whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. Uh, we talked about that in the previous chapter. 
The teaching of the wise, verse 14, the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life. And this was also a, a, similar to another proverb that was just a few chapters ago. And the one, I'm sorry, that one may turn away from the snares of death. So the teaching of the wise is a fountain of life so that people can turn away, turn away from the snares of death. Now, a snare is basically a type of a trap. Right. Um, you would use a snare like to, the snares you kind of put on trails yeah. and you can catch deer, technically. Um, so it's harder to catch the deer. <laughs> it's easier to catch a rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I know you know, Zach. <laughs> but I didn't know they knew. <laughs> um, verse 15. Good sense wins favor, but the way of the treacherous is their ruin. And this is kind of what I was talking about when, I, when we were looking at that question of the, question of the uh, week. Good sense wins favor. Well, what if somebody is opposed to you? Good sense wins favor. You know, even if somebody is opposed to you, that doesn't excuse you from doing the wise thing. Even if they go to the grave opposing you and, and what you're standing for, you do what's right because it's the wise thing to do. Good. So, okay, and then, uh, blam. Not, that's their problem. Oh, well, that's just their problem. They need to, they need to just deal with it. Well, no, that's not wisdom. And it's also not just pointlessly arguing with somebody. Right. You know, good sense. It's not like, I think I can win you over by my plentiful words. We already talked about why is people not opening their mouth. We already talked about that. <laughs> so you know that you're not going to win them over by your wisdom. They're just going to pour out on them, right? No. We know that that's not going to happen. So, um, okay. It takes us to verse 16. Okay. Okay. Oh, were you still writing something? The last word. Go ahead. Okay. Verse 16, And everything the prudent acts with knowledge, but a full... Uh, prudence is kind of like... We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Like, kind of like discerning. Okay? Um, and everything the discerning person uh, acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. And the idea here is that a prudent person is going to going to slow down and make a decision wisely. They're, they're not going to get in a rush when they're making a decision. Whereas a foolish person is going to flaunt their folly because... Their, yeah, yeah, get her done. Get, uh, you know, they don't, they don't stop long enough to discern. That's why I said the prudent person, the discerning person, versus the fault and foolish person. See what I mean? Yeah, the foolish has been... Yeah. You know, and I know you guys have met people like this. Oh, yeah. They just want it now. Right, and they, right, exactly. They want it now. They want it yesterday. Now's not even good enough. They wanted it yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they're just like, they're all over you. They just they just have to have do it their way. They get themselves into... into into messes and then uh, they get themselves into more messes later on because they didn't learn the lesson because uh -huh. they didn't stop for long enough to pay attention to what, to what God was trying to teach them um, so in everything the prudent acts with knowledge with, with discernment with understanding a wicked messenger falls into trouble but a faithful envoy brings healing now here's the idea of, of I, I, what a king would send an envoy a messenger um, and the idea is that when you, when a king sent a messenger, that they would hopefully bring peace in the situation, a diplomatic you know conclusion, something good for everybody. But if you sent a wicked person, a, a foolish envoy, chances are they would have messed up your deal with that other country. And so how does that apply to us as a bigger whole? Well, it's the same kind of thing. If somebody sends you to do a job and you do it well, even if you're not serving the king, and even if you're not a messenger, if you're working for somebody and they appoint you to do a job, and you do it well, you will bring healing to the situation, or restoration, or you bring uh, unity, or uh, progress to the situation, success to the situation. But the wicked person, if you go in and do, do, act foolishly excuse me, over the situation that your boss appointed you at, you obviously fall into trouble. Now notice... The faithful envoy brings healing to the situation, but the uh, wicked messenger falls into trouble himself. Mm -hmm. See that? Notice the contrast? Um, so, verse 18. Poverty and disgrace comes to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof it, 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 it is honored, and heed is like pays attention to. Okay? Um, a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to, this, now, that, remember, I just mentioned that he's going to bring this back up. It was in verse um, 13, I think. No, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul. 
but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. And what he's saying here, did you notice how those two things don't really seem to go together? A desire fulfilled versus turning away from evil being an abomination? What, those, how do those things go together? It's so obvious that it actually, I overlooked it. I actually had to go and look at other what other people were saying, other translations, kind of get an idea for it. It's kind of simple. Evil people, they don't have lasting, lasting joy. They don't have lasting fulfillment in the things, right? They're always craving but never getting, right? right? Even, I mean, even when they do get it, it's not good enough. They always want more. So a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but the evil person isn't going to experience that because to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. They won't change their course of action, so because they won't change how they're living, they won't ever experience uh, the, the, the fulfillment, the desire fulfilled. See, it's, it's so simple that I overlooked it. <laughs> uh, verse uh, 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. This one is important for our kids, guys. Don't sacrifice your kids to immoral kids. Did you ever, did you ever ha see someone who has their kids hang out with the bad kids so they're a good influence on them? Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Uh -huh. Paul said something very similar. Does anybody remember what he said? No, that's... He did say that, yes, but that's not what I'm talking about, right. no. <laughs> Don't sit at the table this time. Uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. No, but that's a good one, too. Um, the one... Oh, crap. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Hold on! Hold on! I can get it back, guys. Don't worry about it. Um. Oh no! Hold on! Oh, crap! I can get it back. Um. Bad company corrupts good morals. Oh! Oh! Got it! Got it! I knew if I stopped for a second, I could get it. Okay. All right. Um. Disaster pursues. So there's another way you can get wisdom. Associating with wise people. Disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. Now, at first glance, it seems like that he's saying this, that there is a curse that follows people and a blessing that follows righteous people. And that is possible, and the rest of the scripture kind of allows for that, too. Okay, And we know that sometimes there are curses that are placed on people who are wicked, right? But I think it goes beyond that, too, because if you notice what he says there, the righteous are rewarded with good. So it seems to be that this is what he's saying. Sinners, the natural result of sinning is disaster. See what I mean? But the natural result of righteousness is good. That seems to be what he's implying too. So which one does it, is he intending? I'm going to leave that to you guys. Pray about it. Study the, study the words. See what you guys think fits better. Um, verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Now, he's not... This is not what he's saying. Save your wealth for your kids and for your kids' kids. He's not saying that. Okay? And he's also not saying be stingy. Okay? This is what he's saying. When you live wisely, you have money to spare. But a wicked person, they consume not only what they have, but they consume the inheritance for their children. Remember that in this society, there was a definite inheritance. You know, Abraham's inheritance, for instance, went to his second-born son Isaac, not his first-born Ishmael. Then Isaac's... Uh, um, inheritance went off to Jacob, not Esau, because Esau sold his birthright and then Jacob fooled his father. And then Jacob's birthright kind of went to a few different people. Yeah. <laughs> kind of Joseph, kind of Ephraim, and kind of Judah. Yeah. Kind of. It's it's a little bit confusing. Maybe we'll look at it someday. We're not going to look at it tonight, though. <laughs> uh, anyways, and so the idea here is that the wise person has plenty to spare because he handles his stuff wisely. He's not commanding you to leave an inheritance. However, we need to balance this verse with the previous verse where it said about wealth gained rapidly. Yeah. Remember that? And so do I think it's a bad idea to give your kids an inheritance? No, I don't. 
But I would say maybe teach them the character to where they'll be able to handle that inheritance. Right. And maybe not let them know that you're going to give them their inheritance until you no. give it to them. Right. That way they aren't expecting it. No. Or also, maybe here's another idea. Don't give them a lot. No. Give them some. Maybe no. like, for instance, um, Zach's dad gave him a car, for instance. You know, instead of leaving them thousands and thousands of dollars. Right. Probably a better idea. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even helping them to get started if they're helping up a business. Helping, in, like, maybe buy some stock in their business. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, um, what's another good idea? Uh, if they're going off to college, yeah. buying them new clothes for college. Or right. paying for, like, a semester or two or something. You see what I mean? Helping them to, to be a hard worker. Right. But you don't want to be an enabler. An oh. enabler is someone... Who prevents somebody from reaching their full potential? And the thing is, most enablers think that they're helping people reach their potential. Most enablers think that. Well, I'm helping them. I'm I'm getting them out of debt. I'm I'm helping them to. No 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 no. What you're doing, you're not bailing them out of jail. You're teaching them how to not get into jail in the first place. Well, right. And the thing is, too, you've got enablers, you know, and stuff that help people who are saying alcoholics or drug addicts or whatever, but enabling people in this way is just as destructive. Right. Right. Yes. Any questions on that? Not always wise to give money, especially a lot of it. You know what I found despicable that Christians have justified as an act of kindness? They'll see someone on the side of the road, maybe even a genuine homeless person. Sometimes there are fakes. Right. But maybe as a genuine homeless person, and so they throw money at them, and they th I've done my good for, good deed for the day, and then they go off. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. What? Okay. So you didn't help them at all. You didn't c talk to them at all. You just threw money at them and went by as quickly as you can, so they didn't interrupt your life. How is that doing the righteous thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think sometimes we get the connect here. Anyways, um, okay, verse twenty-three. The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. I read this one and I was like, now what the heck is he talking about? I'll read it again. The fallow ground of the poor would yield much food, but it is swept away through injustice. Now I know you have a different translation. Read your translation. Uh, a poor man's field may produce abundant food, but injustice sweeps it away. Think about that for a minute, because I was stumped with this one for a long time. A long time. Any ideas of what the heck he's talking about? It's a way of like farming, where you have lots of crops. Like somebody that is you just like wicked, like a wicked person. Wicked. Okay. Okay. How so? Like stealing it? Yeah. Okay. All right. There's an idea. Yeah. What were you gonna say? Is it kind of like the whole life isn't fair mentality type thing? You know, things happen. I don't get what you're getting at. Could you reword it? Or what are you saying? Well, like the first part makes sense, but the second part, I'm, I'm not getting it. That's where I was at too. <laughs> what were you trying to say? I, I don't know. I think I need different wording on it because the ESV is a very good wording. Not understanding the words are you. Okay. Alright. Now, I, I really like what you had to say, Zach. Yeah. But I'm not sure that's what he's trying to say. But I liked what you had to say. It, it's just, uh, because that is that is true that, that wicked people do do take, you know, from what other people are working hard at. You know. Yeah. But I'm not gonna write that answer off. I think that you're onto something. I, 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 I'd like for us to remember something Zach's close, answer. Something close to it. Um, I'm going to give two, uh, two other answers, yeah. but I'd like for you guys to remember Zach's answer too. That poor pe the, the poor people are working hard on their fields, but then wicked people come by and, and steal from them or, or somehow otherwise prevent them from, from, from 
from their full produce. I want you guys to remember that. But um, some answers that I looked up, um, and these were my two favorites. The first one, he, excuse me, <coughs> he could be contrasting the rich and the poor. That the poor people work hard on their fields, but then the rich people are wasteful with, you know, they get the food and they're just wasteful with food. So there, there's a, um, a one that was hinted towards a lot. I, this one isn't my favorite. I prefer the other one. Um, it seems to make more sense. Because it just seems to flow with, with not just my own experience, but with what Proverbs is saying. It's, it's, I think it's my favorite answer. And it's this. Some poor people are poor because they're just not smart with what they have. Yeah, that could be. A good, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the fallow ground of the poor would yield much food. It, it's possible, but it's swept away through their injustice. The, have you ever dealt with somebody out here who's poor because they just don't have good management? Have you ever dealt with those kinds of people? They're oblivious. Yeah. 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 They're oblivious. They, they could have money plus some yeah. if they would just manage their finances. They, their fallow ground would yield much food, but through their injustice, they're not, it, yeah, it, it disappears. That's the one that seems to make most, most sense to me. However, that was before I considered Zach's answer. <laughs> so I want you to really keep in mind Zach's answer, too. And once again, this is one of those things where it's not overly clear. And the text actual, actually um, leads with, with multiple translations. Uh -huh. And if you go to commentaries, that's not much help either because they have a bunch to say about the possibilities of the different translations too. Right. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we're not entirely sure. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you think about it, consider the, the things that have been said, and, you know, go study for yourself, see what you think, what you come up with. Um, and then we get to verse 24, the, verted, uh, the dreaded 13:24. Oh boy, if you grew up in a Christian household, do you know this one? Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline. Let me start out with this. It's not demanding that you spank your kids. It is not demanding that as the only way of disciplining your kids, okay? Let's put, it, put a bow on it right there. It is not saying that that's the only way, okay? We're all good on this? Right. Awesome. Thank it off. Remember, Proverbs are not commands. He's not commanding that you can only spank your kids, nor is he condoning as judging someone else for not spanking their kids. He is not judging us for doing, I mean, not telling us to judge other people who do not spank their kids. Why do I bring this up? Because you know how many people I've heard on both sides of the fence, that's not right for you to spank your kids, versus that's not right for you to not spank your kids. The Bible says. Right. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, so with that being said, Whatever your whatever your decision is on spanking or not spanking, it is not condoning abuse either way. Okay, it's not saying you have to beat something out of your kids. No. And we're gonna look at the end of the end of the lesson. You know, some some reasons to spank your kids, but I would argue that there are very few situations that you should spank a kid for. Spanking is a means of intimidation, which is good in some situations. But it shouldn't be the only only thing we do. It should be, in my opinion, it should be our last resort. And it should only be given if the kid is dis intentionally displaying rebellion yeah. just or just an absolute negative. And I would furthermore say that it loses its benefit once a kid reaches a certain age. Yeah. Once your kids start treating, reaching 10, 11, 12, well, 13... Once they're big enough to spank you back. Yeah, yeah, it's starting... It, you and, go to grounding. Right, and, right. And the idea is that... How do I want to say this? It, the, the idea is that kids go through formative years where you're forming them, like clay. You're molding them. And this is their, their toddler years. They're... Their, their, Everything before preteen. And then they start getting more of their character and then they make their own decisions. And they start yeah. choosing who they are going to be. And then they start getting into their preteens and their teenage and then their young adults and then their adult and then their middle age. And, you see what I mean? And, and they start becoming their own person. Mm -hmm. Spanking is only of limited benefit. Okay, remember that. Spanking has a very limited benefit. You, and it only has a benefit in a certain time frame of their life. Right. So you don't want to overuse it. You don't want to be, you don't want to be over, you don't want to be a tyrant as a parent. Right. Okay. With that being said, you also don't want to be, you know, hey, 
Just do whatever the heck you want. Yeah. You want to find a balance between the extremes, you know? And I will say this, concerning yelling at kids, because that goes hand in hand with this. It has been proven to, to slow down your kids' uh, development. It's been proven to cause other issues, such as depression and other things like that. It's proven. Yelling, they've never done a study on yelling and said, hey, this is a good thing to do. Watch your tone of voice when you're talking to people. Not just kids, adults too. Watch your tone of voice. Our words do hurt people. Even more so kids who look up to us. You know? Um, and, and I would very strongly warn you that when you've got a kid that's not listening, you don't yell at them because there's lots of reasons. Besides what I just said, James also talks about this. The anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. You can't intimidate your kids into living righteously, righteously or listening to you or whatever by yelling. All you do is teach them that it's okay to get mad, it's okay to lose your temper, and when you do lose your temper, it's okay to raise your voice and it's okay to hit things or whatever. That's all you're teaching them. So once again, I would highly encourage you, well, just like Proverbs says all throughout it, watch your mouth because wise people don't just spew out their mouth, okay? I've seen this a lot, a lot, a lot, where people try, they go to the extremes. They either are yelling at their kids or they're beating their kids or they're just not even doing anything with their kids. There is a healthy balance that we need to find. Talk to your kids with dignity. Talk to them in a mild, calm voice. <laughs> talk to them in a mild, calm voice and talk to them like you expect them to obey. Like, Don't talk to them like you think that they are uh, yeah. the world's world's worst person. So, so they grow inferior of themselves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And when you when you talk, absolutely yes, absolutely. Yeah. And make and sure that like, you talk to them in a way where they don't think that they're the bad guy, and they don't think that you think that they're the bad guy. All right. They know that you believe in them. They just did something. They messed up. Not the end of the world. They messed up. We're moving ahead. And then sometimes kids are just being kids. Yeah. They're just playing and they weren't paying attention to you yeah. what, asking them to calm down because they're kids. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? So, once again, you were going to say something. You're done? Yep. Are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? Because you have the well, smile on your face. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Uh, is it, was it going to be something against what I said? <laughs> no? Well, why don't you say it? Is it funny? Uh, is it funny? It be oh. oh. <laughs> Can you tell us afterwards? Sure. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. It's not that righteous people have never made mistakes, but they learn and are continually learning. I want to say that before we, we go on to chapter 14, because sometimes people look at somebody's life. Look at all the mistakes you've made in the past. Our past doesn't define us. Our choices now define us. So I don't want you to write somebody off because they have made bad decisions in their life as not being wise. I know a lot of people who have made bad decisions that then grew and became wise throughout the course of time. Remember that nobody is just born wise. Sometimes we seek it on our own. Sometimes something comes by that causes us to seek after wisdom. Okay. So with that being said, the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. The idea of never being satisfied. Righteousness, well, you don't really need the satisfaction of the earth. So Proverbs 14. Any questions on 13? We're good? Awesome. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. How? What are some ways a foolish woman would tear down her house? It says in 14.1, the wisest of women builds her house, but the folly, but folly with her own hands tears it down. How? Cheating. Okay. Doing her own thing and... Husband does his own thing. Mm -hmm. Being rebellious. Okay. Not respecting your husband. Okay. Is this something that you, you believe? Or something that you're... Okay. Because I don't want you guys to give me answers that you think I want. I want you guys to give me answers that you want. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Uh, getting addicted to stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I've seen a way that the the husband will work, and the wife, while he's away, will spend their money on all kinds of excess stuff. Now, I'm not con I'm not condemning women buying clothes. I'm not condemning that at all. But there are some women who get credit cards hidden from their husband. Yeah. And max them out, buying themselves clothes. Yeah. 
I think that's a good example of tearing it down with their own hands. Uh -huh. <laughs> you you see what key, I'm saying, right? That tops, yeah. Keeping secrets from, secrets from your spouse. Uh -huh. Were you going to say something? I was going to say, every time I'm at Wells Fargo and they ask me if I want to do a different credit card, like, I have to talk to my husband first, and like, your husband doesn't have to know. I'm like, uh, uh, yes, yeah. he does. <laughs> He's the one bringing in the money. <laughs> my gosh. Wow. Well, you don't know why. <laughs> I see that we're just well, $200 every month is just disappearing. You want to explain that? No, not really. <laughs> I'm supporting the children somewhere. <laughs> now, I do want to clarify something. People have oftentimes claimed that the Bible is sexist, that it's male-dominated and it has nothing for women. Let me kind of clarify something. The entire book of Proverbs is for a man and how he should act. The only thing that women have is a verse here or there and then the chapter chapter 31. That's it. So before you go on saying like... Uh, Chuck and I were joking about something that was on Dr. Phil or something, where he was all saying that his wife didn't match up to the character of Proverbs 31. <laughs> he, I think he misunderstood Proverbs, because yeah. the man's supposed to follow the whole rest of the book. Uh -huh. The whole rest of the book, and not only that, but in each instruction to a woman is a hidden instruction to a man. For instance, the wisest of women builds her house. So how does that mean that a man can get away with tearing down his house, too? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that, yeah, but it kind of is implied. Because although, yes, he is telling a woman not to tear down, tear down her house, he's also implying that a man shouldn't either. So once again, it's not sexist, oh. but if you have a problem with, with, with sexism, sexism and you think that everybody is sexist in the whole world, you're going to find it everywhere. It's like feminists... They are convinced that the Bible is obsolete because it, it's it's not feminist. It's like, okay, whatever. So then they rewrite all of Scripture to back up their views. Anyways, 14.2. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. Did you hear what it just said? He who, Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. Who's him? God. Despises God. In other words, he said exactly what 1 John said hundreds of years later. That if you follow God, you will obey his commands. If you love God, you will obey his commands. If you don't. But doesn't that mean that we're saved by our works? N no, it means that when you love God, your, your ways show that. Uh, four or three. Does, does verse yes. more apply to Christians? Because, I mean, if you, if you, if you talk about the non-Christians, um, I don't want to say they don't know right from wrong, but they are they don't have God in mind when they do bad stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah. to them, dishonoring God, that's not what they have in mind. When a Christian does something wrong, knowing that he shouldn't be doing that's more of the summary God. I see. So you're saying, is this verse to Christians who are obeying and who are disobeying? Right. Rather than to the world and... Right. Okay, no. It is to the saved people, the righteous people, Christians, and the rebellious people, sinners, people who are sinning on accident or on purpose. Oh, okay. Um, a backslidden Christian or someone who's never been saved before. It's, it's just a, a simple contrast. Um, it's not meant to be oh, okay. um, too, um, too built on. It's just meant to go, show extremes. Um, the, um, whoever walks in uprightness versus the person who doesn't walk in uprightness, regardless of what their background is or whatever. Basically, the idea is, if you are doing right now the right thing, it's uh, your love for the Lord, and if you are not, it's your lack of love for the Lord. And so then people say, what about when wicked people do good things? What about when wicked people do good things? Obviously, they're not doing it because they love the Lord. No, but there's a there's a there's a moral standard yeah. in people mm -hmm. to a certain extent. They will do good to a certain extent. Yeah, and it's that conscience within all of us. Now, I do want to make a little distinction. People get a little bit confused. How can God send good people to hell? Okay, well, let's back up. First off, God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves when they don't when they don't obey God. Okay, so with that being said, there's a standard of good and bad, and everybody on this on this earth is somewhere on, on that scale, good or bad. 
However, good people don't can't earn salvation, and bad people can't lose. Can't you see? What I mean, you can't do anything being good or bad to earn salvation. Yeah. Then, apart from this scale of good or bad, there's righteous or unrighteous. That's what decides if you are if you are going to heaven or not. The only thing that make, makes you righteous, however, is Christ's blood. So there's a little bit of a disconnect. People, okay, so Hitler's over here on the bad side, but then there's people over here like my grandma. She was pretty nice. I don't know if she was a Christian or not, but she was pretty nice. And uh, I think I'm a pretty good person. Yeah. Well, see, that's putting yourself on the good-bad scale. And that does exist. There is a good-bad scale. There are people who are good in, in regards to society. It doesn't make them righteous, but it still makes them good. So now we've clarified that, we can go to what this verse, what, what I was as asking before, um, which was about... Uh, the wicked doing good. Yes, the wicked... Thank you, yes. The wicked doing good things. Wicked in the sense of not righteous, which means that they are going... You know, even Hitler did good things. Right. Oh, yeah. Not everything that he did was bad. Did you also know that there were other people who were worse than Hitler? Mm -hmm. Who killed more people than Hitler killed? Mm -hmm. Did you know that there were... See what I mean? There have been racists before, before Hitler. He wasn't the first of his kind, and he wasn't the only one of his kind. He's, no. he's probably not going to be the last one we ever face, either. Okay? <laughs> So let's let's get, out, get that out there. However, different people have different amounts of, of bad things that they do in their life. We all do bad things in our life. But some people do bad things more frequently. Does that kind of make sense? So wicked people can still do good things, even good things frequently, but they're not righteous. Does that make sense? And so when they do it, it is simply to appease their own conscience or a societal norm, something that is commonly accepted in society. Right. It's never to honor God, even though it's similar. And this may sound confusing, except for when you look at the book of, Levit of Leviticus. It talks about these different offerings, and it says, Don't even bother offering, giving the sacrifice to God unless you join it with the salt of the fellowship. Basically, they had to put the salt in every single one of their sacrifices. That salt is representative of Jesus. Jesus has to be a part of us before our good works count for anything. Otherwise, we're just offering a meaningless sacrifice yeah. to nobody. But Jesus is the salt in our sacrifice. In other words, he takes our good works and he makes them good works to God, where they're actually worthwhile. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, uh, verse 3. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will pre uh, preserve them. Obviously, the idea of, of, of wise people <laughs> keep themselves from pickles, whereas fool, foolish people um, get themselves into their own trouble. They dig themselves holes. They, they get themselves into debt, that kind of stuff. Where, verse 4, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Now, I heard, I hear this one quoted a lot, but hardly ever do I hear the second part quoted. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. That's a very simple idea. You can, you know, the, the, you can clean out the manger and it'll stay clean unless you get an ox in it, right? Oh, yeah. Then the ox is going to poop in it. Yeah. Then you have to clean it out again. Uh, we use that this example at church a lot. We could make the building really nice and clean, but if we're going to be reaching people, it's going to get dirty and messed up. But it's the second part that actually adds weight to the whole thing. But abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Well, we've got ox in our manger. That's not the point. It's not the, the, the point is, by those ox, by those ox, you can have abundant crops. See, it, it, it's reaching a goal. And I think that that's equally as important. So, yes... Our church is going to get messed up and damaged because, you know, we're reaching out to people, but we're reaching out to people so that then they can go and reach out to other people, too. It's a process. We're, we're reaching not a select group. We're reaching people, Everybody. right? Right. Awesome. Uh, verse uh, 5. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. Um, basically, it's what pa Jack Sparrow says in Pirates of the Caribbean. It's the, it's the honest people you really have to watch out for because you never know when they're going to do something dishonest. Dishonest people, they're always going to do something dishonest. But the honest ones, those are the ones you got to watch out for. Right. Verse uh, 6. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. Did you hear what you just said? A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain. But didn't we just say that anybody can find wisdom if they see for it? Yeah. But a scoffer seeks it in vain. As in, they don't get it. This is a, a principle I want you guys to understand as clearly as possible. Let me, let me, let me wait till verse 9 to say that. 
because that's what I plan to say. But okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and come back, and I'll come back to that. Um, genuinely seeking but not finding, uh, that's because a scoffer, by nature, repeats their behavior and doesn't listen. They scoff. They make fun of. They, they scoff. So scoff means to make fun of, right? To, to ridicule. Right. So the, it becomes very, very simple. While somebody is scoffing, they will never get wisdom, even though they genuinely seek after it. But when you stop ri ridiculing and you start listening, you instantly at that moment change from a scoffer to someone who's growing in wisdom. Instantly at that time. But so long as you continue in the action, you're considered a scoffer. But as soon as you turn your, turn your back from scoffing and start listening, you're instantly no longer a scoffer anymore. Even though you, you used to have a long way to go before you start thinking differently. Pretty weird, right? Pretty weird. First John mentions these things, and it blows our minds, and it was in Proverbs the whole time. Um, verse 7, Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Once again, he's not saying that you cannot be witness to people. He's just saying don't don't associate with, 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 with foolish people because it's just going to rub off on you. You're not going to learn anything there. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. And you know what the thing is? We we justify hanging out with a foolish person. Well, they're saying something I like right now. Oh, well, they, they, they need my influence in their lives. Oh, yeah. Okay. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. But the folly of fools is deceiving. In other words, fools are deceived by themselves. But wise people, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way. In other, in other words, wise people wisely consider their ways. But foolish people are blinded by their foolish ways. Mm -hmm. So, verse uh, 9. Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. Now, this goes right back to what I was saying. Oh, I'm sorry. There was an alternate reading I was wanting to, wanting to read you guys before I go into this, because this one's a really important one, and I'm going to forget if I wait any longer. In 13.24, it says about whoever spares the rod hates his child. There's an alternate reading that goes like this. Whoever loves, um, uh, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him early. Mm -hmm. And I like that, yeah. because it's there's the idea of before it becomes an issue. You're training him up in righteousness as a toddler, as a as a as a as a baby, as a crawler, yeah. and then as as a young young child, and then before he gets to his preteen years, get to him early. It's like a tree; you want to prune it when you first plant it, so you have the right branches where you want them to. You don't want to wait till the tree is seventy years old. No. So, uh, yeah. verse nine: Fools mock at the guilt offering. Now, now check this out. Okay, just because you approach God doesn't mean He accepts you. This is a biblical principle I want you guys to get as soon as possible. Because a lot of people genuinely desire God, and they never get from Him. Okay. Now, I want you guys to understand this, this principle, so I'm going to show you two different biblical examples of it. The first one is in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3-7. through 7. There's these two brothers, Cain and Abel. They both bring a sacrifice to God, both of them. But only one of them is accepted. And this is what God responds when he responds to uh, uh, Cain when he denies his, his sacrifice. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had a regard for Abel and his offering. Right here in verse 5, this is the part I was saying. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard, so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Did Cain genuinely seek after God? Did he genuinely bring, bring a sacrifice? The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, he's talking about Esau. Esau was Jacob's brother. Jacob is a person you later know as Israel. Israel's 12 sons become the 12 tribes. Um, so uh, his, his brother Esau sold him his birthright. Um... And this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 through 17. And I'm going to pull this together. I know this sounds crazy, but just hold, hold on a second. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Verse 17. 
For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. And I don't really want to get too much into the whole salvation thing. Can you lose your salvation? Yes, you can. Uh, can you, well, more like you can give it away. It's not something you accidentally do. It's something that you it's do on purpose. You on yeah, you, it's not something that, oh, whoops, I lost my salvation today. Uh, but um, with that, people also ask, well, so one, once you lose your you lose your salvation, can you ever be saved again? Yes. The simple answer is yes. I don't want to get into that. That's something completely different. Um, but what I do want to show here is just because you approach God doesn't mean he accepts you. Okay, I just shown you two examples where, where he did not accept the person. So what does that mean? That means this. You can genuinely believe that you want God and seek after him and not actually be seeking after him. And God will not, will reject that sacrifice. Okay, but here's the thing. Anybody who genuinely repents and genuinely seeks God with a whole heart and keeps on seeking him will find Okay? But, just because you are approaching God doesn't mean you are actually seeking Him. And this is where it becomes important to discern your motives. Cain was not accepted, whereas Abel was, because Cain was not offering from his heart. Abel was offering from his heart. Abel's offering was heartfelt. It was genuine. It was sincere. Cain's wasn't. See, I mean, God's not impressed with our words. He's not impressed by our perfect prayers, by our perfect speeches. God just wants our heart. And when we come to him like that, humble, he accepts us. But when we come to him with pride, he rejects us. Do you understand the difference? So, I want to say again, just because you approach God doesn't mean he accepts you. You have to approach him with the right heart. Okay? And this isn't like one of those quarter machines. Well, I put my quarter in the machine and I turned it. I should get my candy now. God's not like that. God is... Hebrews says like this. God is able to distinguish between your soul and your spirit, between the bone and the marrow. He's able to see your motives versus what you actually did. What you intended to do versus what you actually did. What your heart cry was versus what came out. He's able to discern the you versus the you that you make other people believe that you are. Okay? I did. Um, so it's kind of important. So now, how does it apply to this? Fools mock at the guilt offering. They don't approach it with sincerity and with honesty. But the upright enjoy acceptance. You know, sometimes fools may offer offerings to God, but it's not accepted. Whereas the, the upright enjoy acceptance. The upright know that they are accepted by God. How do they know that? Because they came with a sincere heart and a humble spirit. Right? So, verse 10. <clears throat> Uh, we'll plow through the rest of this pretty quickly. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. You don't know how... I'm sorry, you don't know or understand what is in others, other people's hearts. You don't understand what people are going through. Remember this proverb. When Next time you think that you can correctly judge somebody's heart. Okay? You can. There's never an excuse when you can judge somebody's heart and what their motive and intention was. Okay? You can assume sometimes, but assuming... What's that thing that people say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said it. <laughs> uh, verse 11, the house of the wicked will be destroyed, but uh, the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that, in verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. And obviously throughout Proverbs we see, the, we see a balance between extremes. In verse 8 it said, the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, so he's carefully deciding which path he's going to go. But then in verse 12 it says, there's a way that seems right to a man. So you mean to tell me that even after I, correct, after I work hard on, on discerning my step, whether I'm doing the right thing, I can still be wrong? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. And that's exactly what he said in chapter 3 when he said, trust in the Lord with all your, all, all of your, uh, well, all, all your heart and lean on your understanding. <laughs> that. Um, exactly what he's saying. And the idea here is that wisdom is to keep your way, but wisdom is, must always be tempered with trusting in God. Yeah. Because true wisdom is trusting in God, and true trusting in God leads to wisdom. Uh -huh. They're interdependent. Okay. Um, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. How do you know when it's your idea and when it's God's idea? I'll be preaching on that in a few Sundays. I believe it's the Third, 
fourth, third, third, third. That morning one? Yes. Yeah, the third. Third Sunday in the morning, I'll be preaching on that. Oh. There you go. Uh, June. Third Sunday of June in the morning. Um, okay, verse 13. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I had a note for 11. Wickedness leads to destruction. Okay. Um, even in laughter, the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. You see this a lot with people with depression hiding it. You also see it with people who mask their 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 sorrow by by going out and being social, and then afterwards, when the party's all gone, they still have the feelings left over. Fourteen, the backslider and heart will be filled with the fruit of his. Uh, also, remember this: that proverbs aren't given so that you can judge somebody else and discern somebody else. Proverbs are given so that you can discern yourself. And he says throughout Proverbs, he contrasts, a fool does this, a fool does this, and then he constantly says, says things that make you look inward and challenge yourself, rather than pointing everybody else around, oh, well, they're a fool, they're a fool, they're a fool. Right. See what I mean? And let me go ahead and clarify this while it's on my mind. When Jesus said not to call somebody a fool, there's nothing wrong with actually saying that something is foolish or that somebody is a fool in itself. The idea is, what he's, if you look at the whole thing he's talking about, he's talking about more of the attitude. When you when you in anger call someone a fool, that holds you up to judgment. When you call somebody a bad name because of your anger or whatever, rather than assessing something. See what I mean? Well, that was a little bit foolish. But when you say something like, that guy's a freaking idiot! See what I mean? Like when you're driving and you get some road rage? Yeah. yeah. There's an example of what he was talking about, okay? That's why. Okay? That's why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, Okay. 14, the backslider of heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. Verse 15, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps, Facebook. <laughs> you heard me, Facebook. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. I saw something the other day on there that said, before you act, think. Before you speak, think twice. Before you post it on Facebook, think three times. <laughs> I like that. Um, so there's a few things I thought of. Facebook, obviously, anything right. social media. Yes. The second thing I thought of was assuming. Uh, Did they actually say that? Well, no, but I just, I kind of got the vibe. Of, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. And you couldn't possibly be wrong, and maybe the text was misunderstood. No, nope, no, they for sure. Okay, all right. I know how to read text. I know how to read text. Okay. <laughs> um, news. And yes, I'm not talking about fake news, Ben. Uh, but sometimes you read things in the news that are going to be skewed. Okay? Republicans. Fox News is not very reliable. Get over it. Democrats. CNN is not God. Get over it. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Just because it's on the news or it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. You still have to do some legwork and see if this is actually true and accurate, okay? You know? no, that reminds Golly. Me. Sorry to drift, but do you remember it was on, like, it was in emails and stuff. They were sending uh, the, Afri the, the African the, prince no, that had the, the inheritance? <laughs> about the bonsai cats. They, they, they would grow them in a box. What? And, and you, would, you would feed them in a box and stuff, and they would live their lives in a box. They never got any bigger than a bonsai tree, right? That's hot. <laughs> and my mom was just freaking out about these bonsai trees. <laughs> and were they real? No. I was thinking, that doesn't sound real. <laughs> no. If I saw an ad on that, I'd be like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Who knew that with all information at our fingertips with the computers and the internet, we'd still be misled by such obvious and blatant lies? Come on. Right. Uh, anyways, and then the last example I thought of was gossiping. Well, I don't like them, and I want to believe that this is true, so I'm just going to say it's true. <laughs> okay. Verse 16, one who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. This is something you see throughout Proverbs. A wise person stops and thinks before he acts. A fool keeps getting himself into problems because he can't stop long enough to, act, to think. Right. He's always, he thinks something, so it instantly comes out of his mouth. He feels something, so he instantly does it. The fool is the person who cheats on his wife. Because he, he didn't think this one through. Like, oh, well, you know. See what I mean? So verse 16. Uh, one who is cautious. Why is this cautious? Verse 17. A man of quick temper acts foolishly. Right? Goes hand in hand with that. Um, and a man of evil devices is hated. Verse 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The prudent are crowned with knowledge. 
Verse 19, the evil bow down uh, before the good, the wicked at the, um, at the gates of the righteous. Evil doesn't prosper or win. That's the basic idea there. It's not that we will always get what's, what we deserve and they will always get what they deserve on earth. That's what he's saying. It's also not saying that just because you're a good person means that you're going to be the ruler of the world one day. That's not what he's saying at all. So, verse 20, the poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. I like that. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor. <laughs> but the rich, oh, he has many friends. Now, obviously, they're not real friends, but, you know, mm -hmm. people surrounding him at all times. Uh, verse 21, um, which uh, kind of goes hand in hand with the other one. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner. So that idea, who's your neighbor? Jesus clarified. Everyone. Everyone's your neighbor. But blessed is he who is generous to the poor, the very lowly of the lowest. See the difference? If you um, if you despise someone, you're a sinner. But if you watch out for the lowest of people who in no way can pay you back, this is good. Verse 22, they, uh, do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, I'm not at 24 yet. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. Have you ever worked for somebody who spends way more time planning what to do than actually just doing the thing? And if they would have just done it, it would have been done, but they always have to think of a better way to do it, a faster way to do it. They sit there and think, they analyze the problem for about two days before they, just do it. Just do it. Um, in all toil, there's profit. If you're working, there is profit. Even if you work slow, at least there's a profit. Right. But mere talk tends only to poverty. It, it, it's good to be a thinker, but when you're just a talker and not a doer, that's probably the problem. Uh, verse 24, the crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. Now, there's a few different ways to understand this. The crown of the wise is their wealth. The crown, in other words, um, how I understood it at first, that the wealth of, let me just reword it, the wealth of the wise is their crown. Does that make sense? Yeah, let me say it differently. Wisdom is the reward of, uh, of wisdom, or riches are the reward of wisdom. And I didn't understand which one. And it seems like he's saying that riches, okay, look, the crown of the wise is their wealth. Not is their wealth, is their wealth. So you're, do you see, are you seeing the difference that I'm saying there? Because English is kind of stupid, and it could go either way. Do you see what I'm, do you see what I'm trying to say? <laughs> um... It makes more sense if he's talking about actual riches. In other words, wisdom brings rewards, but not the rewards are what is sought. See, wise people act wisely, but if you're trying to get a reward, then you're going to end up acting foolishly because foolish people have those desires that are incurable, right? So thereby, you won't act wisely and you won't get the reward. Kind of a, I think, I think it constitutes a catch-22. <laughs> that you can only get this by this means, but you can't do the means without getting it. See what I mean? <laughs> so it's kind of a... Anyways. Uh, so the basic idea that I'm overcomplicating, evidently, I guess I was the only one who got lost on that proverb, because you guys are looking like you totally understood it, and I struggled with this one for a long time, so never mind, guys. Maybe you should teach the proverbs. <laughs> Verse 25, A truthful witness saves lives, but one who, con who breathes out lies is deceitful. A truthful witness saves lives. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. How often do you see that today? That they had to break the law in order to do the right thing. They had to, you know... You see it on the television shows all the time nowadays. You know, that, that yeah. good can only be accomplished through evil means. Uh, in the fear of the Lord... Now, this is a series of a couple different Proverbs that talk about specifically the fear of the Lord. It starts in verse 26. Um... In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. Okay, But then in verse 27, again, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Now, we just read about how wise people, their words are a fountain of life. And now, it flips it, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. That one may, may turn away from the snares of death. So obviously, they're equating that the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And a multitude of people is the glory of a king. Now, this one is also another one that confused me, guys. Now, obviously, you guys are going to just understand it. And I'm going to be explaining it for no reason, but I will anyways. And a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people, a prince is ruined. And the idea is success of leadership. 
and it says in a multitude of people. In other words, you did your job right. You're you're protecting your people. You're guiding them. You're you're doing what's right. You have the ability to fight against invaders. Uh, it's the proof of your wise leadership. You're not overtaxing your people. They haven't fled away from you. Because if you are a king, you're appointed as a king, but you're not king over anyone. What good does that do? <laughs> See what I mean? So, that leads to a few different applications that I drew from it. A pastor, uh, the glory of a pastor is his people maturing. Uh -huh. If a pastor has everybody in his congregation, nobody is growing, it, it, or even nobody's going to the church. Mm -hmm. See, what we do is they're not growing if we don't see that they're growing. But sometimes they're growing just if they're there. You understand what I'm saying? Some people are so come from such a, a skewed background that just coming is a struggle. See what I mean? And so you should always see it like this. In fact, last Sunday night, if you were there, oh, a lot of noises, guys. I could barely keep on on topic. Okay. And this, I was I was complaining to God during during when the words were being given. I was complaining. I said, you know, God, this is just a complete waste of my time. Why am I even waiting for words to be given? Why don't I just hop to the sermon? He said, they came because they want to learn. And I said, okay. And I stopped complaining. <laughs> That's good enough, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, and so there's that. Uh, parents. The, the glory of a parent is to see their child succeed. Yes. It hurts to see your kids move on. It hurts to see them go and get married and to not need you anymore. But that is a sign that you succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want your kids to be depending on you when they're 40. No. You want them to go and do something with their life and to go and live their own life and make wise decisions. Uh -huh. You want that. It's hurt. It hurts, but it's good. Um, just like when a pastor loses somebody in their congregation because they go and decide to be a missionary. Yeah, it hurts to see them go, but you're glad that they're doing something good for the kingdom. Uh, government. Um, the glory of a government is their people prospering. Mexico government, for instance. How much glory have you heard from the Mexican government? Hardly any. Why? Because their government sucks. And how can you tell? Because their people are impoverished. Mexico, the Mexican government had multiple opportunities to change things, and instead they decided it was better to do it this way. See what I mean? The glory of a government is, a, is, a, is the prospering of the people. So now, take it back to this, exactly what he's saying here. Uh, the glory of a king is, uh, where is it? Jeez. In a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people, a prince is ruined. So, uh, that takes us to 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly once again. Slow versus fast. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't help but think about the uh, the story of, of the of the rabbit mm -hmm. and, and the yeah the hare and the and the, and the, and the tortoise. I guess I, I always call him a turtle, but I guess he is a, tur a tortoise. That he was going slow and steady. And that's kind of the idea of wisdom too, the slow slow steady space. Because how many times have you gotten all gung ho? God, I'm never going to do this again. And so you get all gung ho, and then in a couple days you burn out. Right. Well, what happened? D don't you love God? Of course you love God. But you didn't go slow and steady. Just stick with it. You burned yourself right. out. Yeah. Just like the hair did. Oh, I got time. Whatever. It's fine. Whatever. Uh, one thing that uh, I was I was watching the Seven Hundred Club one time, and there was this guy that uh, they have a section called "Bring It On" where they ask questions mm -hmm. or whatever, and they answer. And this one guy was saying, you know, that he was having a problem with. Uh, with alcohol, and uh, he, you know, he kept falling back into it and everything. And uh, Pat Robertson told him, he said, uh, you know, with with alcohol, you you have to take it one day one day at a time. Don't look at, you know, I'm never gonna drink again. Look at today, I'm not gonna drink, you know. And it's a lot with our Christian walk too. We have to take it one day at a time. Yeah, and that that applies to more than just alcohol too. I mean, that applies to so much in life. Uh, really, all kinds of addictions. Great point. Uh, verse uh, thirty, I guess. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Wow. This verse per has a personal meaning to me, so I'm having a hard time. Um, Figure out a simplified version. Um, have you ever really, really wanted a change in your life? A better job, better family, better car, better house? It doesn't matter what it is. And you don't have to answer because I know sometimes the answer is a little embarrassing for people. That kind of a desire has a way of just eating you up. 
And the more you desire for it, the less you have it. I mean, nothing's going to change. You're just going to desire more and more, and you're going to be less and less happy with your life. See what I mean? A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. Be content. And Paul said it like this. If we have food for the day and clothes on our back with that, we're going to be content. Because we came to this world with nothing, and we're going to go and leave it with nothing. And just a few years after he wrote that, he died for something he didn't even deserve to die for. So, uh, Verse 31. Whoever oppress, uh, oppresses a poor man... And you know, there is more to that verse. Um, my saying on it is skewed because it has personal relevance to me. But I would highly encourage you guys to go study it for yourself. Because that's, that is a great verse, and it has great things to say. Whoever... Also, read it in different uh, translations. Okay, like one... one uh, an alternate reading is... Um, a healing heart gives life to the flesh, but jealousy makes the bones rot. It's an alternate reading. Um, there are different translations of the words. You know, look at it through different two different translations. See what you find. Verse thirty-one: Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Obviously, we have a contrast here: oppressing versus helping. It shows the two extremes. It doesn't say anything about ignoring them. It doesn't say anything about a middle ground. Either. The poor, the poor, the person oppressing the poor person, or the person being generous to the needy person. Now, I don't know if that's saying that to ignore them is to oppress them, or if it's just drawing on the extreme contrast to encourage you to to help help the uh, needy. I'm not sure. Um, I'll leave that one for you guys to ponder. I think that's something. You know, it's it's good in the Bible when you when you have a question that's not immediately answered. It's good to have a question that you just ponder for a couple of weeks. That, that's a good thing. And I think a lot of times our spiritual growth is halted because we don't want to just stop and ponder for a little bit. Just think about what you read. You know, you don't have to instantly have all the answers. Just think about it. Um, the wicked is overthrown through his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge uh, in his death. And this one kind of confused me, but it's the idea here. First off, this is one of the very few examples in Old Testament in the Old Testament that show that there is a hope after death. Okay, oftentimes it's very vague, like talking about Sheol and different stuff. And it's like, well, so is did the Old Testament people believe in life after death? And it's kind of vague, but this is one of the clearer examples. But the idea here, and I think my my footnote here said it great, and I'm just going to read off it. Although the Old Testament does not contain a fully developed doctrine or teaching of what happens after death. Proverbs does reveal that people who are in a right relationship with God have the hope of a peaceful and secure life after death. When the wicked die, they have no hope because it only seals their final ruin and separation from God. But when godly people die, they commit themselves to God as their source of hope and security beyond death. And I just thought that was that was really good. Uh, verse 33, Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. Have you ever hung around with somebody who said something stupid? And, well, they they made me mad, or they made me whatever. Well, if you hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have... Uh... Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. We don't act wise because it's convenient. We act wise because it's wise. Does that make sense? Not because somebody else acted wise, and so we tried to trump their wise, trump their wise with our wise. But regardless of what they did, did, we did what was wise. The idea of doing what was right because it's right. So obviously you can see a contrast of 14... Uh, um, I'm sorry, yes, uh, 1433 with 133. Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. So if there's a fool saying something, I should say something, right? Well, then we have to go back to 133. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He opens wide his lips, comes to ruin. So how can you say something wise without saying something wise? Well, there's a few things. First off, it's not saying that a wise person never speaks. They speak when it's necessary, and they say things that are necessary and that are good. Okay, but then it's kind of like a balancing act once again. Dude. You don't have to go to the extremes. There, there's the idea here that wisdom is shown through actions first off. See what I mean? But it's also shown in what's said. So maybe instead of arguing with the foolish person or shooting off your trap, if there's an opening to say something, say it and keep it brief, and otherwise 
See what I mean? Just excuse yourself from the situation or act with dignity in the midst of it. So once again, this is things where, where it doesn't... Do you notice how Proverbs doesn't tell you, when you're in this situation, do this. When you're in this situation, do this. It tells you Proverbs. But you have to think about Proverbs because in different situations, you have to follow a different kind of protocol. You know what I mean? Sometimes you'll be witnessing somebody and don't say a word. Sometimes you'll be witnessing somebody and you, and you have to actually interact with them. Well, how do you know? Wisdom is found in discernment. It says earlier in Proverbs, wisdom dwells with prudence. Discernment and wisdom, they go together. It's not, this, it's, this is how you deal with the situation. It's, these are life principles. Now, the situations are going to differ, though, so you need also prudence with your wisdom. Verse 34, I guess. Yes. Yes. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A servant, in verse 35, a servant who deals wisely has the king's favor, but his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. So, uh, just real quickly here, um, we're out of time, so I'm not going to ask this question, I'm just going to answer it. What are some reasons for discipline? Correct, uh, to correct foolish behavior, to give a sense of morality, to correct reckless activity, to stop rebellion, to stop disrespect. I think that's a, that's a pretty good um, beginner's, guide, beginner's guide to what are some reasons for discipline. You don't want to discipline for everything. Sometimes kids are just being kids and we hop down their throats for nothing. And it applies to other things too. Pastors sometimes hop you know, hop on the situation too quickly and other pastors don't deal with it when they should have. It goes in life in general. Anytime there's a situation with discipline. At work even. So next week we have the barbecue. I am really sorry that it went so late, guys. I, I did not intend to end at 8.30. Um, I'm going to go ahead and quit. If you had any questions or comments, please save it for next two weeks from now. Please stay there for two weeks from now and write it down or whatever.